Microsoft showed off a new Surface Pro with a dongle in the box. If you want to toss your dongles, you can get yourself a Huawei Mate Book in rose gold, and RoboCop can now read your emotions. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1774, recorded Tuesday, May 23rd, 2017. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you what you need to know about technology today. <gasps> da, da, I'm, da. I'm Jason Howell. <laughs> it, I feel like we needed like a, a quick zoom. Normally, Brian would be all over that, but I think he was dealing with audio levels. <laughs> Whatever. Today. Having to multitask and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. All right. Sh sh is my volume bad? No, you're good. Okay. All right. Shall we get to the news We're then? good. Yes. Let's do that. Microsoft's education event. <laughs> <laughs> we threw off Brian. I'm sorry, Brian. We totally threw you off today. Uh, uh, but I'm sometimes, so confused. Sometimes it's fun to see what Brian comes up with. Microsoft's education event in Shanghai is underway, and as expected, a new Surface Pro was unveiled that does away with its numbering scheme altogether. We were wondering if this would even happen. Well, there you go. Configurations begin with Core M3 and Core i5 models, all the way up to Intel's seventh generation KB Lake processor and higher end units. Microsoft says the new lineup is capable of, of uh, supporting 13.5 hours of battery life. It includes a new hinge design that allows the display to actually lay nearly flat without snapping. I guess there were issues in the old model with a snapping hinge and includes support for the surface dial, that cool, cool little dial you can put on the screen and you know, help you with artistic stuff or whatever you happen to be using it for with your applications. Uh, one thing you won't find in the box, however, is the Surface Pen. Now that is an option on every model and no longer included with a purchase. That's nice looking hardware. What do you think? Well, now you that you're the, the Windows 10 expert. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Leo did give me his Surface yes. book. His old Surface book. And, and you I know everything about it now. I know everything. I set it up last night. Okay. I have to say Cortana was exceptionally pleasant. Really? I felt like we were setting it up together. Like she wow. was just talking me through it. And It's okay, Megan. Don't worry. I will help you. She basically, yeah. she's even better than that. Wow. <laughs> but there is also the pen as a magnet and it magnets to the, it sticks to like the that. side. I That's like so that. great because I have no idea where my Apple Pencil is. And I never use it because of that. I actually do know where it is, but it doesn't stick to anything. You wish pen. it had a dock? Yeah, of some I sort. do. I do. So yeah, this is uh, this pen is supposed to be uh, even better. It has mm -hmm. a, a, a slight angle for sketching and shading and such. Uh, a lot of people are upset about the USB-C. Oh, no, no USB-C, but there's a dongle in <gasps> the box. It's dongle life. Dongle in the box is the song I like to sing. <laughs> dongle in the box. I don't know what that means, but I like to sing it. And uh, there, I just can't believe how much people talk about the fact that there's no USB-C. And I was really trying to get at like what, what's what's moving the needle here? Why are people so uh, concerned with it? And if they are, why isn't there a USB port on there? And what they say basically is USB-C is kind of for nerds. Like it's not for your average person. It's for nerds that are going to use a dongle and be okay with it at this point. But your mm. average person, like USB-C has a lot of problems, right? Like you could buy a USB-C cable on Amazon and like, you know, mess up your system. And so it's just not for the, it's not for your, the average Joe or Jane. Man, and I'm so, I mean, I'm so used to USB-C at this point. It's, it's- You're a nerd. Practically, well, it's practically a standard on Android devices now. Nerds. At least for the last couple of- <laughs> Wrong. All nerds. Wrong. <laughs> that's a lot of nerds, by the way, if that's the case. Uh, but yes, yeah, actually, I, I will admit- I am a nerd, and I'm pretty proud of it. Yeah. No, I'm saying uh, that affectionately <laughs> only, of course. Um, but I don't know. I've, I feel like USB-C more and more is kind of a standard of modern mobility. And, you know, that having... And I guess when you compare it to, you know, the fact that USB-C is on other laptops of this ilk, you would expect to see it there. But, I mean, you know, also a... a uh, 
kind of an element of of modern technology is that we're living in a dongle life and i suppose if there's the, that option via a dongle then mm -hmm. that maybe that's good enough right well there's no usb c but there is alcantara on the keyboard and i don't even know what that is it's like the keyboard is made of alcantara it's such an apple thing to it's, have like it's a fancy that, sounding like, soft, nice suede, suede feeling yeah. thing yeah. that i don't understand yet cuz i've never alcantara. felt it alcantara mm, it does look very soft mm -hmm for whatever reason you might need that. Um, Pre order today. Okay. If you're into the today, Alcantara. $799 it starts. Uh, the type cover, $129. Surface pen, $99. Shipping on June 15th. Should also add about the pen, uh, the uh, the Microsoft pen. You, you mentioned the tilt feature, which is mm -hmm. a nice bonus. Also now increased pressure sensitivity up to 4,096 levels, up from 1,024. Mm -hmm. So basically they're saying now you're at the point where it, it almost perfectly mimics like putting a pen on paper and writing with it at different, you know, degrees and levels and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if you know this, and I mean, you probably do. I'm probably the very last person to know this, but there's shortcuts in the pen. You can go and it does things like you can assign it shortcuts, go just to uh, like open windows and stuff. It's awesome. I'm just click, 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 click. Um, so do you think that you're actually going to use the pen a lot? Is it, is it the no. kind of thing that you'll turn to a lot? Well, when I become an artist, which oh. that's, you know. I, I right around the corner. I, you know, I still have time for that, I think. Yeah. But yeah. no, I've been using it, actually. It's it's easier to use it than, you know, your finger, I feel mm -hmm. like. And then you don't have to mess up your screen. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I'll get into OneNote and drawing, you know, writing with my hand. Who knows? The future <laughs> is yours. You know, it is mine. In other Microsoft news, the company is making inroads, inroads with the Chinese government by creating a version of Windows 10 that's just for them. The company announced this special build in Shanghai today, but we don't know many specific details. It's called the Windows 10 China Government Edition, and it comes after more than a year of collaboration with local trader China Electronics Technology Group Corp., or CETC. It's based on Windows 10 Enterprise Edition, and Windows head Terry Meyerson says it includes enterprise-level security, identity, deployment and manageability features, and different encryption algorithms within its computer system. There might be additional components that we can only guess at, but according to Bloomberg, the data that, the, that Microsoft extracts will stay in China and not be delivered back to Microsoft as my, all my data is now being delivered back to Microsoft now that I'm back on Windows. Lucky but they're going to keep it in China. Okay. <laughs> Lucky you. Maybe you should move to China and then it won't be sent back to mm -hmm. Microsoft, but mm -hmm. then it'll be sent to China. Um, yeah, it seems like, I mean, Microsoft has had a long time struggle, not even just recently, but a very long struggle with legitimate copies of its software in China. Balmer, C. Balmer once said nine out of 10 copies of Windows in China were pirated. I don't know if that's a scientific or a fact or a guess, but there you go. It illustrates an, a, a problem that Microsoft has had for a long time. Um, and so I, I think this is at least one way where Microsoft can make some changes, make some sacrifices uh, to kind of tackle you know the cultural issue of piracy and hopefully gain some some money from their installations in that country as a result so. well not only that but security too i mean that's mm -hmm. pr the problem with pirated os right. is they don't get security updates i mean Absolutely. i think that's that's that might even be a bigger struggle for them just the fact that like they can't give patches to these systems if they're uh you know if they're they're not legitimate so yeah i mean i think that myerson says the os com complies with all of microsoft's values uh so i mean it's, it's it's so hard for all these companies to get into china and they really need to um it's probably a little bit easier for microsoft i think so uh, Lenovo will be one of the first uh, third parties to pre-install this version of the OS. Yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, you pointed out security, which was definitely something when I was looking into the WannaCry uh, stuff that happened a couple of weeks ago. The highest, higher concentration of that was in Russia and in China. And F-Secure had posited exactly what you were saying that the reason for that is because there's so many illegitimate versions of Windows in that country, and those those pirated versions just don't get the updates. And so, as a result, that's ripe ground for something like WannaCry to tear through, where you know they're not going to have the updates to prevent it. So, um, but I mean, this is more on the government level, you know. So I. I I wonder, I wonder how Microsoft then 
translates this, you know, at this being the starting point of kind of bringing a little bit more legitimacy into the country with their installations and moving that out into the general public. And I think that's a much bigger challenge. Right. Well, it's the government and it's also for state owned corporations, which is what something that we don't really right. understand right. in the United yes. States because we don't have that. So <laughs> what is, it's yes. like, is that the government or what is it the not the government? You know, so yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, the Chaos Computer Club is demonstrating how it's not impossible to fool a Samsung Galaxy S8 that's secured by iris scanning technology to gain access to the device. Their video, which they posted, shows how someone can snap a digital picture of a person's face from up to 15 feet away if you're using a night mode setting. I think they were using a Sony camera to do that. You print that photo out on a normal piece of paper. Uh, but but make it enlarge it so that's like the, the size of an actual eye in real life. Uh, drop a wet contact lens onto the eyeball printout and flashing that in front of the phone, it will instantly bypass the security measure. Samsung has said that iris protection is nearly on par with the strength of fingerprint security, uh, but that even that is capable of being bypassed. No security measure is completely foolproof, as we know. So this is just another example of no matter how secure you may think these alternatives are, there are ways to get into them. Although at the same time, like, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of assumptions that would be made here. Someone would have to, as, as is often the case, have to be very motivated in order to pull all of these things off and, and, and gain access to the phone. Right. So, yeah, be wary if someone walks up to you with their camera and starts to take hey, your picture. Hey, can you look at, at me? Are, am I 15, within 15 feet of you? Can you look at me? Well, could, I mean, why does it have to be someone, like, couldn't someone, like, take a screenshot here of me and then just, like... I know because I think it's the night mode, the oh, night mode sensor. Okay. No, don't, Brian, don't do this. <laughs> don't do this. We never know. In the future, this might just be the only right. way we secure ourselves. Yes, exactly. Don't look at my irises. <laughs> Iris eye? <laughs> Iris eye, yeah. Okay. Iris eye. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think it really hinges on the type of photo that's taken when you're using this uh, like night mode mm -hmm. technology. It's a different type of of image altogether and that I guess surfaces enough for it to, to identify you, which is kind of crazy, but they pulled it off. Well, my favorite part is that they used several printers to try yes. to figure out and the Samsung printer worked the best. So of that, course that it was did. the best It's one, perfectly so. paired with the Samsung Galaxy S8 for printing out your iris mm -hmm. the most effective way. Uh, so if someone were to steal your Samsung S8, I'm not saying I'm going to or anyone else out there is going to, but you can just, you can remotely wipe it, right? Like I know if someone stole my iPhone and I didn't, I really didn't know where it was. I, I could just, rem you know, mm -hmm. get rid of all the information, get like right. undo the Apple pay and everything. And then, you know, I wouldn't have a phone, which would be unfortunate, but they wouldn't have access to right, it. Right. And that's pretty important. Yeah. I mean, in Android in general, Android device manager is how you could do that. And you can set that up. It's very easy to do uh, on some phones. I think it's set up automatically when you log into your, your account on Samsung though, you know, I've never really looked into it. I have being that it's Samsung and Samsung has their own version of literally everything, I'm sure that they have a way to do this, like my Samsung or whatever mm -hmm. uh, that's on there. Burke, as he eats his ramen, says S8 uses night mode camera for iris scanning. So there you go. Okay. See, it's kind it. of similar, similar <laughs> uh, technology. Thank you. Wow, we're getting so flashy with our effects. But now we know why Burke never shows his face. Yeah, because he's eating. You've never seen Burke's irises, have you? <laughs> uh, I will also point out, I keep pushing for this. I only keep saying it because I really want it to happen. And I and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's totally doable. Combined biometrics, that's where we need to go. I think if we get to the point to where putting my finger on the fingerprint in order to unlock it is really easy to do. But if I can combine my fingerprint with the iris scan, have them both check out and that's how I get access. I mean, all this stuff gets more and more com complex for secure, you know, for hackers to, or people who really want to get inside to defeat it. And I don't see why we can't just have that. So when you let's get there. Yeah. When you said combined biometrics, I was hoping you were talking about your eyeball print. Like you'd have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'd have to put your eyeball on the home button. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds like mm -hmm. an eye infection waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I understand eye infections. <laughs> According to Bloomberg sources, there's an internal email newsletter tracking harassment and bias complaints at Google. The list called Yes 
at Google is meant to point out that racial bias and sexual harassment happens even at Google. Pro tip, it happens everywhere. People familiar with the matter at Google chose to tell Bloomberg about the list anonymously, but management says they are aware and supportive of any means people have to help create a more inclusive workspace, workplace, even if it comes in an email newsletter. Harassment is pretty pervasive across the board, but unlike a place like Uber, it doesn't appear that Google has the same kind of broken culture. So I think this is, I applaud this sort of list. Uber has a very broken culture. Yes. Google might have a broken culture, but it's not to the level of Uber. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I think we would know if Google had a broken culture. Like to me, it seems like Google has the same, I mean, it's a huge company. So there yeah. are bad eggs and good eggs. It's not the don't be evil that it once was. And I feel like they almost uh, get, more criticism because they started that way. You mm -hmm. know, like they even put it into the minds like, oh, you'll never be evil. We'll see about yeah, that. We'll see. I don't um, know. Life changes pretty fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, one one thing that gives me hope in, in this scenario is that at least Google as a company is open to a it existing as a as a way for, you know, people in in this uh, in these situations to kind of talk about it and communicate about it. And B, they're use they they are okay that it exists, that the list even exists, and they're also using it for when something is illustrated within the list that is so bad that obviously like, wow, this really needs to be taken a step further. If you were involved with this or anyone else's, please let us know and we can do something about it. You know, instead of, I could I could totally see something like this list being outed at a company and a company, you know, taking the hard line approach of like, we don't allow for this for whatever reason or, or trying to, you know, bust the people that are behind it and shut it down. And it kind of doesn't sound like that's, that's what they're doing here. They respect why it exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, they said that like there's list people are part of the employee relations uh, and they say they'll look into reports. I mean, some of it seems to also be just like a, a lot of like, I think this gets around the he said, she said, or just like the rumor mill, mm -hmm. you know, like one instance they had was that, uh, Eric Schmidt interrupted Ruth Peratt in a in an all hands meeting or something. And there are other people who said, you know, that was a joke. Like he was clearly joking. And so it's good that this is just sort of uh, up out out in the open as much as it can be. Yeah, um, it do it does make me kind of question like when a when a list like this is created, is it in itself a representation of the fact that official channels have failed or that other aspects have failed that a list like this has to exist. Oh, that's and a good so, you know, maybe that, maybe that's uh, a criticism of, of how Google is working behind the scenes. Uh, like I said, not of Uber levels, mm -hmm. but if it exists in the first place, then it probably exists because there are other things that probably should be happening that aren't. And so people feel, you know, like this is a, another way to get some, you know, benefit or get some resolution. Yeah, it's curious. I mean, my point is like when, uh, you know, when Susan Fowler came out um, a few months ago with her blog post of, you know, just all of the um, instances of harassment um, and bias at Uber, like some of it was definitely crazy. But the fact that people were just like, what? That that happens, what, at Uber? Or that anyone's surprised that it happens anywhere right, is right. always hilarious to me because like, it's just, it, it, it exists. If you're a woman in the workplace, these kinds of things have happened to you. Sure. The end. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, so So it's good that, like I said, it's good it's out in the open. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's go time once again as Google's AlphaGo AI played against and defeated the world's top Go player, KG, in game one of three. This time around, AlphaGo won by the closest margin possible, one half point. But that's demonstrating how the AI is less concerned about its margin of victory and more concerned with simply making winning moves. I guess that everyone involved was super impressed with how it played. Kiji said after the match, quote, last year it was still quite human-like when it played, but this year it became like a god of Go, illustrating how far the intelligence, the artificial intelligence driving AlphaGo has come in a year's time. Because over the course of the past year, AlphaGo, I'm sure, has played a number of matches. They've fed it quite a few, you know, matches, and it's just continued to improve. Improve uh, in the way that artificial, you know, AI models improve uh, over and over and over again. Now, I mean, you know, 
kind of the challenges mount as we go forward. There's a second game on Thursday, final game on Saturday, and also on Friday. I think we had talked like a month ago about kind of the different challenges that they're going to put at AlphaGo. They're doing um, two team-based matches, one where it's a team eight with two pros playing against each other where AlphaGo is one of their teammates, so they're kind of uh, pairing up. And then another game where it cha- where AlphaGo challenges five pros at one time to see what happens. <laughs> the New York Times report on this was interesting because they said that China cut off the live streams. You know, this was in China against a U.S. company's AI. And at the end, when it was clear that, you know, because it wasn't until the end that it was clear that they, that he was going to lose, the champion was going to lose. It was like the 50th move or something had mm-hmm. a statistical advantage after that. But they cut off the live stream so no one could see. Uh, no one could tap in and watch it anymore, which is a very, like, Chinese thing to do, I think. Um, yeah, the, the, the gap, the champion also said the gap between humans and computers is just getting to becoming too great. I know what it, I mean I guess then like what what is the evolution for the game of go when when the machines have proven that no one can beat them Well we uh, just challenge we just pit the machines yeah. against each other <laughs> I guess. I mean, or you keep playing with a, another human for fun, right? It's a game. But I mean, that's no, the it's thing. not a game. It's a way of life. But computers are still not good at a lot of things that humans are good at. Yet, and it's they a long be. way away. Yeah. Okay. Certain things, right? I mean, <laughs> maybe not Go. I mean, Go Go is different than chess, as we've talked about before. Yeah. It has like more moves and more like emotion and planning in it and things like that. But there are still a lot of things that that humans are going to be better at than robots for a long time it's it's interesting to me how much we've talked about ai and and continue and like at like a snowball i feel like looking backwards i feel like that snowball was small when we were talking about AlphaGo last time it was like oh wow check out what ai can do it's Mm -hmm. so smart it can even beat someone in, in go and now it's this gigantic snowball rolling down the mountain that everybody is considering Mm -hmm. and this is like here we are again a a year later uh, man this is just it's crazy to think how how large the snowball is going to continue going if i follow down that snowball metaphor even further please do i'm done Okay. (laughs) Huawei's new Mate book looks like the MacBook Air, but it'll only cost you a cool $1,500. Today, the company announced the new slim aluminum 13-inch Mate Book X and the slightly heftier 15.6-inch Mate Book and the new 2-in-1 called the Mate Book E, all running Windows 10. All the Mate Books are running Intel's new KB Lake processors of different versions, and they'll start shipping this summer. Last year, Huawei released a 2-in-1 detachable Mate Book that was roundly criticized for being neither a great tablet nor a great laptop, but they seem to have learned something, and not just because now it comes in rose gold, which it does. Mm, so if you got one of these Mate books, you'd get a <laughs> <laughs> I realized I realized how bad of a name Mate book actually is, uh, hearing it out loud. Like, Mate I, book. I, the, it the is, is it hard to say or is it just because we're trying hard not to say MacBook? <laughs> that might be it. Okay. It's a little bit more purposeful. Yeah. I don't know. It's a nice looking, yeah. nice looking laptop. Looks good. It's got good on the insides. Uh, Berk, it doesn't Berk have something. doesn't have a. No, oh. it has. Okay. So this is a, this is a big deal. It not only has one USB port. <gasps> Two USB-C ports. Oh, it's like you're Two. swimming in USB-C. So if you're like the aforementioned nerd uh-huh. in an affectionate way <laughs> and you need your USB-C, if you need more, like it has more USB-Cs than the MacBook, USB-C ports. If you if you are this nerd, you've found your mate. Toss book. your dongles uh-huh. if you get a mate <laughs> book. Toss them all over the place. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. <laughs> um, no touch screen, though. On this Mate book, on that not now the Mate book E has a touch screen. Oh, okay. But the All rest right. do not. I just, yeah, I just feel like they should have touch screen. Why? Why get rid of it? <sighs> well, because I, I think they want to make it look more like the MacBook Air. Like okay. they they figured they missed out. I don't know. Focus. I find you know using the Surface Book, it is it's something that your brain has to get used to. For oh, sure. I can touch it and I can use the keyboard. And when am I going to do that? And mm-hmm. so. 
Yeah, I I mean I've got I've got touch on this, which is the uh, the original Chromebook Pixel. I don't use it all the time, but it's definitely one of those things that once you get used to knowing that it's there, it's nice to have that option. Depending on what you happen to be doing on the screen, sometimes it's just easier to do that. So I guess I just like to have the option, um, and especially because Windows 10 is very very touch enabled, so you might as well. Um, but you had mentioned Dolby; their involvement with the audio on board is not just software where either they I guess were very involved with the hardware that went into the laptop and so a lot of reviewers or, or first lookers because I don't know if it's been fully reviewed yet are saying that the sound is actually really impressive compared to laptops which laptops usually have garbage audio out of mm -hmm. their speakers so I don't know I'd be curious to hear it and see what that actually means fingerprint sensor too uh, yeah, in the power button. Mm -hmm. Nice little fingerprint mm -hmm. sensor. I like that. You can that. put your eyeball right on it. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that might hurt a little bit. Chinese tech company Le Echo uh, held a very confusing event last October. I, mean, I remember talking about it here on the show where it showcased a number of TVs, phones, even self-driving cars and Android powered bicycles in an effort to take on the U.S. market in full force. Flash forward now to May 2017 this month, and the company has announced layoffs to the tune of 70 percent of its U.S. workforce. 325 employees in total. Not only that, founder and CEO Jai Yuting is stepping down from his leadership of Le Xi, which is the public um, listed unit that controls Le Echo. He'll be replaced by former Lenovo executive Liang Jun. And uh, yeah, I mean, man, they had such big ambitions for the US, but it was just a jumbled mess, right? Like they had this huge event literally a month later. Uh, the CEO sends a memo to his employees warning about how they've expanded too fast, too quickly. Uh, they've, they've got big company disease. And then, you know, they had the Vizio acquisition that they announced and then bailed on, uh, I think, last month or the, the month before last. So they couldn't follow through on that. Payroll for some U.S. employees had been delayed last month. So it, it's like they had great ambitions at that event. Had they known that like a, a mere month later, it was going to set off a chain reaction that would result in pretty much their U.S. strategy dissolving entirely, almost entirely. Right. But they're not using the word dissolving. They're, no. they're pivoting mm -hmm. to focus on uh, Chinese speaking customers in the United States, of right. which there are lots. So maybe they'll just be smaller. Yeah. I mean, they'll still have to focus on how they reach those customers. Essentially, they want to market their Chinese programming that they already have in their TVs to those Chinese speaking consumers in the US. They still have to, you know, they still have to have that brand recognition, which you don't really have of the brand Le Echo, Le Echo. No one even knows how to say it. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem actually in the US market. But um, yeah, that, that'll be a big challenge no matter how you slice it. Well, the Chinese speaking people know how to say it. Probably. Maybe they do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Is Le Echo a Chinese uh, obvious? I don't know. I'm I don't sure know if it's any more obvious. Know. No, it sounds, it, yeah, it's true. I don't know how you would say it in Chinese. I don't know if they have a Chinese name. Uh, but the Faraday Future was also a partner. And oh, they yes. say not to worry. Um, I mean, they're, in, they're investing in Faraday Future and they'll continue to invest. Not to worry. The Faraday still has a future. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, John Moss writes in, uh, in my defense, actually, that audiobooks do count as books. John wrote, I managed to read between 75 to 100 books every year. See my Goodreads profile, profile for proof. I trust you. Uh, I didn't. I, I checked. Did you? Did you do due diligence? <laughs> <laughs> he says, but because I am always reading, I listen while commuting 90 minutes per day and while walking my Rottweilers 30 to 60 minutes, most days, weather permitting. At lunch, I read an ebook on my tablet and I participate in various real world discussion groups that sometimes require print editions. I own five years worth of print books to be read and shelved at home, plus another thousand or so ebooks. I feel like he's just bragging at this point. Uh, <laughs> but to say that audiobooks don't count, flies in the face of how you first learned to read. This is a really great point. I never thought of this. Your parents most likely read stories to you at bedtime. The oral tradition of storytelling goes back to the dawn of civilization. It's a really great point. It's I true. never thought of it mm -hmm. like that, uh, even though he's, he's totally agreeing with my defense. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a new part of my defense that I'm going to co-opt for myself. So thank you. Right, because you were reading aloud to your children. Yeah. Every right. single night. Like the dawn of civilization since the, like people have been doing since the dawn of civilization. It's true. They do count. I do both. And I think both count. I was just giving you a hard time. I mean, right. if you just listen to books, 
it, yeah, it's, you got it. For me, though, personally, I want to keep reading and I feel myself reading less yeah. uh, every day. And I, I don't, I don't want to do that. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said for the tradition of actually sitting down with a book. Like we said yesterday, the, it's, it's hard to top that, that ritual, mm -hmm. I suppose. And I, but I will say about listening to books, because it's kind of more of a passive instead of a 100% focused thing, sometimes I get less out of listening to a book, mm -hmm. even though it fits into my life a lot more conveniently than actually reading a book. If I actually take the time to read, sometimes I feel like I get more out of it mm -hmm. because you're, you're focused. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not multitasking when you're reading a book. You're reading the book. If you're listening, you're, you might be doing other things. That's mm -hmm. usually how I listen to books is, you know, I'm at the gym or I'm driving or whatever. And so, you know, sometimes retention is a little more difficult that way. Maybe that's the difference. Mm -hmm. True. TNT's fan of the day is Bean on Twitter, who sent us this picture saying, kind of curious, is this the first Wii U game pad on here? I don't know. Uh, yeah, is it? You know, I meant to search that and I completely uh, dropped the ball. I'm going to say yes, Bean. You are the very first. And then if uh, somebody actually did send one of these in, Email us, tnt at twit.tv, with the picture that you had sent in, and you'll remind us, and we'll put it in again, because why not? It'd be awesome if you could actually control us with the gamepad. Like, <laughs> if you could, like, get me to shut up by just, like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right. Jason won't shut up. <laughs> yes, that's, that's my kind of game. Mm -hmm. Record a video of yourself or your setup. If you've fi figured out how to control us with whatever device, please put that up on Twitter or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. Yes, we will. RoboCop is coming to Dubai, though it's only threatening if you have an irrational and distinct fear of kiosks. The Ream robot is designed by PAL Robotics and stands five feet six inches tall which wheels with wheels that roll it from place to place. It has a touchscreen interface for doing things like reporting crimes, uh, paying traffic tickets, filing paperwork, the most boring police officer in the world. Uh, voice recognition could be included when it hits the street, powered by IBM's Watson AI. Dubai expects robot officers to evolve to 25% of its workforce by 2030 and has plans for those robocops to become fully capable police officers. Are you scared? Uh, I'm only scared that it can understand our emotions. That's oh. the part. Like it, it's there. It has an emotion detector, not a motion detector, <laughs> not a but motion an detector, emotion. But like it has <laughs> facial recognition. And it can tell whether you're smiling or frowning or feeling bad, and will react according to that. So mm -hmm. maybe robots can do everything we can do. Apparently, they can. <laughs> uh, also, by 2030, Dubai wants to have the first smart police station with uh, all robots. No, no people, no human employees in the place. That sounds like mm. my nightmare. And like police, the same way we're talking about, not just like giving like help. Like here's here's the They're directions saying to fully, that. With these, I mean, based on what I read, fully capable police officers. So they'll they'll hunt you down. They'll chase you. They'll say thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There was also something about how it would be maybe less biased than a human police officer. And that we've learned. I mean, if they're using facial recognition, it's not going to be less biased because those databases are already biased. Yeah, the robots were created by humans, so there's bias already built mm -hmm. into them. And Burke, very valuable point, uh, needs at least one chainsaw arm. <laughs> so RoboCops with chainsaw arms, that's the future in Dubai. Mm -hmm. maybe Absolutely. Not, maybe not Dubai, but somewhere in Burke's land that he'll own someday. <laughs> TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. He's very happy about that. 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and you can find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can also find us at our subreddit where we hang out for a large part of the day at technewstoday.reddit.com. You can see the stories that we have posted. You can post your own stories. You can upvote stories. You can downvote stories. And as far as subscribing to the show, you know what I want you to do. Subscribe if you haven't. Tell someone to subscribe if you think they would like the show. Twit.tv slash TNT. Find all the ways. And I'm on Twitter. Tweet at me. I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. You can tweet at me too. Thanks to our technical director, Brian Burnett, as always. Thanks to Burke for helping out here in the studio and Chainsaw Arm uh, comments. Thanks to Kevin for editing the show. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody.